Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Baker. On behalf of the West Virginia University College of Law, Dean McConnell, the WVU Law, Sports, and Entertainment Law Society, and the class of 2011, I am pleased to welcome you all here for this historic event. Today, I have the incredible honor of introducing Dr. John Carlos. Dr. Carlos, a gifted athlete, competed in the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games. It was here that Carlos won the bronze medal in the 200-meter dash behind fellow American Tommy Smith and Australian Peter Norman. Smith and Carlos approached the medal stand in soft feet and, while receiving their medals, raised gloved fists as a silent protest, protest of racism and economic depression among oppressed people here in America. In response, the International Olympic Committee president banned the two men from the Olympic Village and forced them from the United States Olympic team. Following the Mexico Olympics, Carlos continued his education and athletic feats at San Jose State University, where he won the NCAA Track and Field National Championship in 1969. During this time, he broke the world record in the 100-yard dash. Concluding an illustrious career in track and field, John Carlos was drafted by the NFL. After a short career in the NFL, he entered the public sector, working for Puma, the Olympics, and the city of Los Angeles. Carlos endured years of oppression following his dramatic gesture. It was only recently that he began to receive the respect he truly deserves. In 2003, Carlos was elected to the Track and Field Hall of Fame. In 2008, Carlos was a torchbearer for the, for the Human Rights Torch, which ran parallel to the 2008 Summer Olympics Torch Relay. In July of 2008, John Carlos and Tommy Smith accepted the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage for their salute at the 2008 ESPY Awards. The silent protest has inspired songs, documentaries, statues, and was even voted the sixth most memorable event of the century. It affected not only the nation, but the entire world. Carlos continues to touch lives today. I will now introduce to you Professor Andre Cummings, who will tell you how Carlos has inspired and greatly affected his own life. Dr. Cummings. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you here. And it's a great honor and privilege for me to be able to call Dr. Carlos uh, a friend. As a young white kid growing up in Los Angeles, uh, born after the historic event uh, in 1968 or close thereto, um, John Carlos and Tommy Smith have inspired me in remarkable ways. When Dr. Carlos and uh, Tommy Smith stood on that metal stand, their gloved fists and, and socked feet represented the oppression of their youth and challenged and protested the racism that permeated the United States at the time. We were willing to celebrate athletes if they represented us well, but we did not treat people of color equally in that era. And Dr. Carlos and Tommy Smith did not just put their fists in the air. They actually, and I mean this very literally, put their lives on the line in this silent protest. It was one of the most courageous and one of the most bold gestures. It took just a moment. Well. 45 seconds or so, but was one of the most enlightening and bold gestures of our time. I wanted to introduce Dr. Carlos to you by uh, showing a brief clip of the ESPY Awards where he was honored along with Tommy Smith to introduce some of us that aren't as deeply familiar with the story to exactly what was going on at the time and how uh, Dr. Carlos and Tommy Smith changed the trajectory of the civil rights movement.
1968, the year Bill Russell, the NBA's first black head coach, led the Celtics to a world championship. Bob Gibson won the Cy Young Award. Denver's Martin Briscoe became the first African-American starting quarterback. They played in a country that applauded their efforts on the field, yet denied them equality off the field. 1968 may have been 40 years ago, but for many of us, like me, a 19-year-old college student at the time, the events are so vivid, so personal, they could have occurred yesterday. As thousands of lives were lost in Vietnam, decades of discrimination and oppression exploded into streets filled with poverty and rage. This would lead to a bold action by two members of the United States track team, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Tommy Smith was the seventh of 12 children, born to immigrant farm workers in Clarksville, Texas. His earliest memories are of working the fields with his family, struggling just to have food on the table. John Carlos was raised in the city, in the hard streets and poverty of Harlem. Their backgrounds may have been different, but they united to make a statement before the eyes of the world. As Arthur Ashe himself said, I respected the way they stood tall against the sky and insisted on being heard on matters other than track and field, on matters of civil rights and social responsibility. I couldn't help but admire them. In a turbulent era, they provided a powerful gesture, a silent statement of pride and unity after so many years of racism and prejudice. It's hard to explain just how violent the 60s were. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. Keep them moving on, keep them moving in. Because of the color of the skin, we will win the kitchen clean. was a volcanic eruption at almost every level. That's what the world is today. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many guys you feel today? In the States, that is the shaking of the foundation of American civilization. We will define black power. Two major assassinations, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy. The whole American culture kind of came unhinged. After a summer of violence and loss, the eyes of the world turned to Mexico City, site of the 1968 Summer Olympics. The games began as a new sense of black consciousness had already taken hold among African American athletes. There would be talk of an Olympic boycott, but ultimately the athletes decided against it. Still, many of them felt the need to make a statement for human rights during the games. Not a day passed that somebody did not confront you with what are you going to do, how are you going to do it. We had this platform, this stage. The world was looking at you, so wham, there it is. People were really kind of nervous. And nobody was more nervous, of course, than, you know, these, these old white Olympic officials. I think that everybody was prepared for something stunning to happen. But who among them would step up? By day four, no one had. Then Tommy Smith and John Carlos took their place for the 200-meter final. There's Questad. It's a good start. And Carlos, as usual, has burst out of the box. Tommy Smith running pretty well so far. And in lane two, Bombuk is strong on the outside. It's Edwin Roberts. It's John Carlos right now. It's Carlos and Smith. And here comes Tommy Smith. Smith has done it with his hands in the air. Tommy Smith had set a new world record. In the tunnel, before the medal ceremony, few words were spoken. They walked to the metal stand with their shoes off to symbolize the poverty of their youth. Tommy Smith accepted the gold medal. 
John Carlos, the bronze. As the national anthem began to play and the American flag was hoisted, Smith and Carlos bowed their heads and raised a gloved fist into the night air. My prayer was a prayer of solidarity, a prayer of hope uh, that we could unite as a people instead of being separatists uh, in a country that's supposed to be one. Well, once we turned uh, to leave, I really started thinking hard about, you know, the fact that I was a free man. That they would never push shackles on me again. If they didn't want to be thought just as people who could run faster or jump higher. A lot of people thought that was just black power. No, that was black people affirming their dignity. So it wasn't anti-America. It was anti-injustice in America. But for Smith and Carlos, the reaction was swift and severe. They were stripped of their place on the team and sent home by their own country. The International Olympic Committee said you will either take them off the team by 5 o'clock or you will not be in track and field for the last two days of the competition. Smith and Carlos were vilified as militant radicals, but their personal sacrifice had just begun. There would be death threats and hate mail, and long afterwards, isolation and unemployment. Years of desperation and anguish for themselves and those they loved. Tommy's career was... couldn't get a job. He ended up moving in with me. He had lost his apartment. His, his wife had broken up. And he came with a suitcase in his hand. My parents were being harassed mercilessly, mercilessly. There was real concerns around our safety. So he suffered, and he suffered for years. It chips away at your manhood. After a while, you get to the point where these things are so prevalent to you, you hate to look at the guy in the mirror in the morning. It's just amazing how a country can quickly turn that you win a gold medal for your country, and yet as soon as you take that stand and identify yourself as being proud of who you are, then you're condemned. Four decades ago, Tommy Smith and John Carlos used their moment of Olympic victory to remind America of a greater battle yet to be won. Now at San Jose State, where they train together, there's a statue in their honor, a statue that shines a light on our appreciation for their message of human dignity. They could just as easily have stood there with their hand over their heart and the national anthem playing in the background, but to represent their country and say, I want to run for America, but I want America to understand who I am. It took a lot of courage for them to do what they did, a lot of courage. I think most black would probably tell you that day was, was a great day for them because it probably gave them some hope that, uh, you know, we're going to be able to overcome. They were willing to sacrifice themselves for something far greater than a gold medal or a bronze medal. The fundamental lesson of what they did is courage. The courage to think for themselves. And it's the courage to hope. Because what they did was this is a sign of hope. And that's that's a beautiful thing. Two days ago, the JohnCarlos.org website went live. Dr. Carlos has a new book coming out in July, July, The John Carlos Story. Two quick things. One, 
I want to thank the Sports and Entertainment Law Society, and in particular Megan Baker and Karina Kendrick, Brian Nickerson, and the rest of the crew for bringing Dr. Carlos here. And I believe, I really feel like we have a civil rights icon in our presence today, Dr. John Carlos. First of all, let me say it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure for me to come back to town here. This seems like a home away from home. Uh, Dr. Cummins has been very warm to me over the years. I mean, warm to the extent that he called me and asked me would I write a forward for his book. Uh, I was really impressed. I mean, I run my mouth every day, but he's the first individual to say, man, we want you to put something down in words for us. I'm honored to be here. Uh, to discuss maybe my, my history as well as where maybe sports have evolved to from the 60s. As I stated, I was born and raised in Harlem, New York. Uh, God looked like he had a plan for me from day one. You know, I was a breech baby. I was born feet first, trying to give me an indication that something was going to happen with my feet. Uh, my mom had gone back to the doctor three times. The doctor turn me back around in my mom's womb. By the time my mom get home and settle in, I turn myself back. <laughs> this went on the third time the doc looked at my mother and said, Mrs. Carlos, look like this baby has a mind of his own and we're just going to have to leave him the way he is. Sure enough, I jumped out, big feet and all. <laughs> Not knowing that this would be the legacy of my life. Uh, I looked at a guy on TV one time, a young white guy, he used to run around in a green suit, green tights, and a funny hat with a feather. And I'm sure that every kid that was born in the slums of any city admired this individual. Well, I was one of those individuals that admired him very much because looking at him as a young man, it gave me the opportunity to realize that there was two laws in this society in which we live. It was God's law and it was man's law. Man's law, as Dr. Cummins was saying, set up various rules and regulations that didn't really suffice all of the people. God's law protected all of the people and gave them that right. So I felt like it was my right to do as Robin Hood did, and I would pursue my Robin Hood move to break in the freight trains in front of the Yankee Stadium. I didn't call it vandalism. I didn't call it thievery. I called it helping individuals that couldn't help themselves. There was many individuals in my neighborhood, and I'm sure neighborhoods across this country, that didn't have food at night to go to school the next day. At the same time, there was no sympathy amongst the faculty as to why these kids were acting the way they were acting the next day. So I broke into these freight trains and stole clothes and food and took it around the community. And I remember my buddies telling me, said, man, our pocket's going to be fat. And I told them, I said, this is not about no money. Everything we get, we're going to give away. Because I remember going up, I had two real good buddies of mine. I used to go to their house. Their mom and dad was junkies. They never had food in the box. We didn't have a fridge. We had ice boxes back then. Wasn't anything for them to eat. I was blessed because I had a mother and father in my house. But we were one of the fortunate families in the community because there was a lot of fathers missing in action because they were strong on those drugs. When you sit back and think about strong on drugs, it's not like a social drug situation as it is today. Most individuals got drugs put upon them, just came out of nowhere. We didn't have a truck or a plane to go bring drugs into Harlem, but one day we woke up and drugs were there. Many individuals, if you sit back and think about uh, Billy Holiday, that scene that they did in the movie where Billy Holiday was on the bus and she saw the Klan party having a rally and they charged the bus. Well, it kind of disturbed her probably for the rest of her life. And someone brought these drugs to her. So to take these drugs and you can forget about who you are and you can go and perform. Well, many of the individuals in my neighborhood did pretty much the same thing. They used these drugs for escapism. Why did they use it for escapism? Because every day they got up to brush their teeth and wash their face, they did not like who they saw in the mirror. When a father can be a father to his kids, 
can't be a husband to his, uh, his wife, can't be one of the leaders in the community, then your self-esteem and your pride and your respect for yourself dwindles to the point where you say, let me escape. These drugs can get my mind off of who I am and what I can't be. I have to look at all of this and weigh in my mind as to whether my father told me the right thing or whether I should pursue what I felt was the right thing. Because my father told me, say, son, I don't want you running with those junk junkies. Stay away from them junkies. But I had to go chase behind these junkies because I had to find out why would you shoot these drugs if you saw what was happening before you, those junkies that came before you. And they told me pretty much what I said. I said, man, do you know what it's like when your kid come home and say, Dad, I need some tennis shoes for my PE class? Or your daughter come home and say, Daddy, my birthday is next week. Are you going to buy me that dress that you promised me? And your wife look up and tell you, say, honey, we've been married for 20 years. What are we going to do for our anniversary? And you said yes to everything. We're going to have that dress for you, son. I'm going to get them PE shoes. And, yeah, baby, we're going to go out and wine and dine all night. And when you turn around from that, you reach in your pocket, and you have nothing but holes in your pocket. Your hands go down to your ankles. Then you say, yeah. I'm worthless. I want to escape from this guy. You have no means to go out and be a provider because you couldn't find a job. And when you find the job, the job was so demeaning. Or they tell you, say, well, man, you know, we have a job, but you're not qualified. You need to go back to school. And it was very difficult at that time for people of color to get into a school of education. Then when we did break the corner or break the mold and we started going to school, and then you go back to the same job that you applied for, and they tell you, oh, we can't pay you that money because you're overqualified. We can never pay you what you work. So it was almost like, damn if we do, and damn if we don't. As I came through in the neighborhood, I began to look at athletes in terms of what their roles were. Jackie Robinson used to come up into my father's shoe shop, and Roy Campanella, and Don Nukin, and all these guys used to come in. And I was just a young kid but proud to know that my father knew all these celebrity baseball players. But then I began to look at what was happening in their lives and how they were treated, and they were treated pretty much like second-class citizens once they left the baseball field as well. I couldn't understand how the police in the neighborhood where when I came into Harlem as a young man, it was socially integrated. And then the domestic workers started coming in and moving in, and then they had a thing called white flight. All the white folks decided, man, we're going to move to the suburbs. And it's ironic that here I am, 66 years old, or 65, and now we have white influx because they're coming back to take Harlem back. And it's happening all across the country. But as a young kid, to sit in my father's shop and experience my first hands-on experience of racism, and I experienced this racism through the New York Police Department. There was two young winos in the street, one black and one white, in the middle of the island right there on Lenox Avenue. And they were sleeping in the street. It was early Saturday morning. And the young cop went over to the white individual. He tapped his nice stick on the ground. The guy didn't move, so then he poked him with the stick. Get up. Move on. Move on. Then the guy got up and walked on away. And then he went over about, I guess, two, three yards away. And there's the black guy there. And I'm just assuming right away in my heart and mind, he's going to tap on the ground. <clears throat> he's going to poke the guy the same way. Well, he tapped on the ground all right, and the guy didn't move, and he was laying on his back, his feet sticking up in the air. And the cop went over to him and went down to the bottom of his shoes and took that nice stick like it was a, a baseball bat and wore the bottom of his shoes out. I've never seen a man levitate off the ground laying down and hit the ground rolling at the same time. But I was horrified in what he did. I went to my father and said, Pop, I said, why did that cop do that? And he told me, he said, well, son, just to let you know, all people here in this world are not treated the same. I got to thinking about that. As that was going on, there was a thing called the English Channel. This guy was swimming the English Channel, or he wanted to swim in the English Channel, and I was a very good swimmer at that time. I told my father, I said, Pop, what's the English Channel? 
I want to swim in the English Channel. What does this guy get? Does he get trophies? Does he get money? Does he get recognition? I'm a good swimmer. I want to do it too. So in the midst of all that, on the radio, we would hear about this thing called the Olympics. Now, I never knew what the Olympics were, but I heard them talking about the Olympics. Pop, what's the Olympics? He said, son, that's when all the greatest athletes of the world come together. He said, they come together to see who's more superior athletically. He said, it shows that this nation is very strong. I said, great, Pop. So do you have swimming? He said, yes. I said, well, I want to go and be the first black to represent America as an Olympian swimmer. And I kept going, building this in my heart and in my mind, training every day in my bathtub. <laughs> and one day my father said, son, it's time we have a talk. I looked at him, I said, well, what are you talking about, Pop? He said, I hear you talking about you want to be this swimmer. It's never going to happen, son. And I looked at him and said, Dad, what do you mean it's never going to happen? He said, well, where would you train? You have to train three times a day. Where would you train? You can't go to the Holland River. You lose your friends every summer. He said, you can't go to the ocean. It's too rough. He said, you can't go to the public pool because everybody's trying to cool off. Where would you train? Just as he said that, it's resonating in my brain. I'll join a club. He said, yeah, you think you're going to join a club, huh, son? So that's not going to happen. I said, well, Pop, we can't afford it. He said, oh, no, I can afford it. But then he did this. He said, merely because of the color of your skin, you're not going to be able to fulfill your dream. I said, because the color of my skin, I can't represent America? He said, no. And I said to him, I said, come on, Pop. And he said to me, he said, well, son, think about this. He said, remember when you used to go up to the high bridge pool, that's the white area, and walk through? I said, yeah, Pop, I used to go there. He said, well, when you and your buddies got in the pool, he said, and y'all hit the water, what would happen? He said, well, I know you got the point, son. And what happened was as soon as the black kids would jump in the water, all the white parents would jump up and call their daughters and sons out the water. Billy, buddy, Betty, hurry up, get out the water, get out the water. And it blew me away because as a youngster, I'm looking at them calling their kids out the water. And then on the other side of my brain, I'm seeing them laying in the sun trying to get my skin color. <laughs> so I was really confused. But I went on. My dad said to me, he said, well, son, are you going to let this stop you? I said, no, nah, Pop, I'm still looking. I was a good boxer. I wanted to box. My mom told me, she said, no, nah, son, you my baby boy. I don't want you to box. They're going to break your face up. Promise me you won't box. Basketball, I got in with Kareem. We played good games, but they waste too much time arguing about who fouled who. So I walked away from basketball. By my Robin Hood activity, two New York police uh, detectives, Mr. Lester and Mr. Bryant from the 32nd Precinct, they knew my father because my father used to have the poker game after work in the back of the shop. And they went to my father one day and said, Earl, you know, some break-ins, and uh, we think Johnny is doing so-and-so, and you need to tell him my father stopped him. Go. He said, no, nah, that's your job. You need to tell him. He's over there at McCoon's Park right there where they build a new Yankee Stadium. That's where we used to have our little track meet. He said, he's over there in the park right now. Go over there. Well, they went. They blocked the whole park off. They found me and my buddies, told my buddies, go sit on the fence. Johnny, you come here. Yes, sir, Mr. Lester. What can I do for you? He said, we want to tell you something. There's been some break-ins, and we think we know who's doing it. We can't do anything to him until we catch him. And then he leaned into me real close. He said, and we're going to catch him. <laughs> Mr. Bryan was about six, 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 seven, hands like this. He leans in, and he says, well, we have something else we want to tell you. What's that? You have an ability. What's your ability? What's my ability? You're a runner. And when he said I was a runner, I kind of smirked about it. And Mr. Bryan smacked me on this side of my face, and his fingers landed on this side of my face. <laughs> and I said, stars. And I said, well, well, well Mr. Mr. Bryan, I'm not trying to disrespect Mr. Lester. I said, but he said, I'm a runner. And every woman in the neighborhood who got their purse snatched will run the purse snatcher down and get her purse back. So I'm nobody special. They said, no, you're special. That's how I got involved in track and field. But then my mind is developing about, I haven't lost the concept about why I was breaking into the freight trains. I haven't lost the vision about what happened with those windows on the corner. I haven't forgotten about the fact that my father told me about I would never be able to make it to the Olympics as a swimmer, merely because of the color of my skin. 
But as I got involved in this track and field, I didn't particularly like track and field. I wasn't geared for track and field. But I played hooky one day from school, and that's when they were filling out all the paperwork. Well, my boys changed the school that I wanted to go to because they thought I should go to this other school for their track program. So when I got there, they said, man, you going to machine and metal trades? I said, man, they don't have no swim program there. So no, they got a great swim program. They didn't have a pool. <laughs> I got there, they got me involved in track and field, and I started to escalate in the sport, and I realized that this sport here could be the beacon for what I need to do in terms of bringing everybody into focus about how we are as human beings and how we can have a better society. I realized the more I trained, the more I won, the more opportunity I would have to have a voice and be able to express who I am and what I see wrong or what's broke and what we can be fixed. All my life, my father had a situation where whatever I did, and I did a lot of things, my father would tell me, say, son, you got 48 hours. 48 hours to have the right answer for my question about why you did X, Y, Z. My father came to me one day after many years of whipping that butt. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, son, I just want to tell you before I leave this world that I'm very proud of you. And, you know, for any kid to hear your dad say you're very proud of you, I really felt good. But I said to him, I said, why are you so proud of me today, Pop? <clears throat> he said, because from the time you was a little boy, you always did what you felt was the right thing to do. You knew about repercussions, about doing something. If I thought it was wrong, you was going to get that spanking. He said, but as much as I whipped you, you never changed your attitude. You never backed down from what you thought was right. And when all the dust settled every time, every instant, come to find out you was right and I was wrong. He said, I couldn't take the whippings back. He said, but in silence, I just want you to know that you've been right all along and don't change your ways. I looked at my father and said, Pop, I'm you. Everything you come from South Carolina, from Camden, South Carolina, with, you embedded in me. My old man taught me about him being in the First World War, what he had to go through in a segregated war where they had the white officers there. And I always asked my father, said, how you get that bullet hole in your jaw? Because he had a bullet hole there. In 1969, my father was getting ready to go to God. I'm in the hospital talking to him, and I said, Pop, I said, you get ready to leave here? Because he told me he's sort of light. He talked to God, a right-hand man, or whoever it was. I said, well, look, before you go, Pop, tell me how you got that bullet hole. And he told me, <coughs> he said, help me out the bed. I helped him out the bed, and he had his little gurney on. And he's turning around, trying to show me his button. I'm looking like, Pop, what you doing? He said, well, I can't tell you about this bullet hole until I tell you about this one. And I never know he had got a shot in his butt. And he said to me, he said, son, he said, it was a white officer in the Army wanted us to take a certain hill. And I told the officer, we don't mind taking the hill, but you guys always push us out to die. Why don't we take the hill together? And the officer said something. My father said he said something back, and they started arguing. And the guys in the military told him, say, Earl, come on, let's just go do the job. He said, well, he went, and they was going up on the barbed wire. He said, all of a sudden, he got this blaze of heat through his butt. And this particular officer shot him. And when he turned around and saw the guy, and the enemy shot him in the jaw. He said, the bullet landed on his tongue. He said, now he became disillusioned about America. Because he said, here I am in the First World War in a segregated army, representing the United States. And then when I came home, he said, it was worse than it ever was when I was in the military. And I got to thinking, wow, how long have we been dealing with this? How much longer are we going to have to deal with it? And then I started to think, we are going to this because of all the ethnic groups, not just the blacks, or the Hispanics, or the Asians, or the Indians. We all have to stand up to try and make things right. It's a broken society. If we don't fix this society, the people of the society in which we live, I sit back and I think about all the people in Iowa right now, or the people that's in Indianapolis right now, even the people in the Middle East. I wonder what they thought about Tommy Smith and John Collins back in 1968 when we chose to challenge society and say there's a problem. The problem is that most consciences have gone to sleep. 
We chose to do something to resurrect people's conscience and have compassion and concern for their fellow man. They stood back and looked at us and said, these individuals are out of line. Now, the same problems that we dealt with back then in terms of saying we want equality, we want justice, we want fair play in this life, that's what people are stepping up for right now. People are saying, how can you take food away from my kids? How can you stop my kid from going to this various university? That was the plan. But now they're pulling it back. Now they're starting to feel how people of color have been feeling forever. Around this world, they're starting to sit back and they're thinking, and say, you know, John Collins and Tommy Smith, there was a beacon. They said that we received this award here for courage. I don't have no more courage in me than you have in you. Only difference is I know how to find mine. I chose to look for it. Other people don't choose to look for the courage in them because they don't feel that they have anything that's truly affecting them. I had black people to tell me, well, John, you know you're rocking the boat because this is the way it is. I had people down south to tell me, uh, man, my family fought in the Confederate Army. And I looked at them and I said, man, what, what color are you? Your family fought in the Confederate Army and you got your chest stuck out like it was something good. I said, do you realize that you, they fought there with a gun in their back to make them fight? It wasn't a voluntary fight on their part. I say, and the problem that we have right now is that we have not studied who we are. And I'm not talking about as Americans. I'm not talking about as Asians. I'm talking about as human beings. To study who we are and where we're trying to go. This life that I live is not for me. My life is for my kids. Your life is for your kids, too. It's not about how good or how bad things are for you right now. It's about how good or how bad things are going to be for your kids down the line. Here, yeah, Mr. Smith had a clear vision of what was going on in 68. John Collins had a clear vision of what was going on in 68. I remember walking down the street in the pin relays, at the pin relays one year, and I was so proud and so amazed to walk down the street and see a statue of Benjamin Franklin and looked at that statue and viewed in my mind of all the statues that I've seen from the time I was a little kid. And the first time I saw a statue of an individual that did something when he was a young individual. Benjamin Franklin looked like he was about 23, 24 years old. That was the age of Mr. Smith and Mr. Collins at that time. You don't have to wait until you get ready to go to God and say, now nah, I can step up and make a move. I can step up and make the right move in life to try and make things better for everyone. You can start doing it today. Your kids can start doing it today. Because if you don't start doing it today, you're going to get swept up in that big snowball that's going nowhere. This is why I'm still on, on the chariot right now. I come out to an audience and speak. I know I'm not going to hit no grand slam. But my God tell me, say, hey, Johnny, all you got to do is reach one. And your job is done. That's what I come in here for, to try and communicate to one person to say, I'm ready to step up and make a difference. Remember what I said. Nothing special about me. All I ever wanted to be in my life was my father's son. My mother's son. I didn't go wake up and say, I want to be an activist. Martin Luther King didn't wake up and say, he wants to be an activist. Rosa Parks had a date that night. She didn't want to be an activist. <laughs> Gandhi, with his sheet, you think he wanted to be this activist? No. None of us wanted to be activists. But some of us felt like Dr. King felt. I have to stand for those that won't stand for themselves, and I have to stand for those that can stand for themselves. You see white kids get up and use the N-word, and you can be white as snow just right there next to them. And in your heart, in your mind, you know what they're doing is wrong. But you choose to shut up and give him the privilege of putting out this poison, opposed to pulling him up and saying, man, you know, you're out of, out of wrong. You're out of, out of line with that. And I oppose what you're doing. And if you don't get yourself together, I'm going to have to step away from you. We just close our minds and accept it because you think this is something that is the norm. Black kids, I don't like them running around using the N-word no more than I like a white person doing it. I hear black people running around to my, oh, well, it's different when I say it. But show me your dictionary where it's different. There's no difference. The N-word is the N-word, whether it come out of your mouth or whether it come out of their mouth. But then you have to sit back and think about ignorance. Ignorance runs all across the world. 
don't matter about what color you are or how rich or how poor. Ignorance can strike anyone. Only way we're going to change society is for us to educate our minds, challenge ourselves to be the best that we can be, and realize that nobody in here is guaranteed five minutes after we leave here. You're going to be judged in your life based on the time that they spanked you on your ass and you gave that first yout <laughs> to the last time they make that cross over you and put you in the ground. You're going to be judged in between as to whether you chose to make a statement or whether you chose to sit up and try and be neutral. There's no neutral ground in this society in which you live. Either you say, man, I'm against racism or I'm for racism. There's no room for saying I'm undecided. By you being undecided, if they're moving you in a racial way and you undecided, and you over here and you can make a move to stop it and you don't, in a minute they're going to move to you. And I'm saying this in the sense that Tommy Smith and I and Peter Norman, very distinct difference. Here in the United States, when we got back from Mexico City, they said, let's go beat up on Tommy Smith. We don't like him. He's despicable. Let's go rock his world. Then somebody said, man, I'm tired of whipping up on Tommy Smith. Somebody said, well, let's go on the other side of town and jump on John Carlos and rock his world. We had an immense amount of pressure. <coughs> friends that we had that we thought were our friends, they began to walk away. There wasn't any jobs. People would say, oh, man, uh, what are you doing now? Well, I'm looking for a job. Well, we wish we could help you, but we don't have anything. When your rent was down, you couldn't go to nobody to say, let me hold anything. People start walking away from you. You had a chance to reflect and say, do I have leprosy? Why are you walking away from me? You can't lend me anything other than support and show me some love. But they left. It took a while for me to sit there and figure out why they leaving. And most people were leaving because fair of reprisal. That same fair was the same fair when they had black women being knocked down by the police in the South and you saw a black men standing there passively because I have fear that if I say anything or I attempt to do anything, I will be in harm's way myself. So they allowed them to knock these black women down that was pregnant and grab them by the hair or put the dogs in the water holes on them. Now, in retrospect, when you sit back and you think about the white fellow on the Olympic uh, podium with us, Peter Norman. Peter Norman supported us 1,000%, and I love this man to eternity. Because when Peter Norman went back to Australia, at that time, Australia was pretty much like South Africa. So they weren't happy about the fact that he stood on that podium in attention. He didn't put his fist to the sky. When he had an Olympic project for human rights button on his chest, just like I did, to say, I believe in humanity. I believe in human rights for all people. When Peter went back to Australia, he didn't have a break. They didn't switch off to Tommy Smith or switch off to John Collins. They banged on Peter, and they banged on Peter, and they banged on him to the point where they gave him a nervous breakdown a couple of times, to the point where they had him pouring that sauce every day, to the point where he eventually cracked, had a heart attack, and died. But at his funeral, I told him, I said, you know, I said, it's great that we have all these people here in Mr. Norman's homecoming. I said, but when he came home from the games, how many of you fine fellas was there at the gate when he came out the airport? How many of y'all was there to hold him up high and cherish him? I said, Mr. Irwin, the animal king, he died around the same time. And there's no way in the world you could ever go and tell your, your kids about Mr. Irwin, the animal king, and not talk about the king of humanity, which is Peter Norman. Peter Norman was a true individual man. It wasn't about no color with him. He was a white guy. But he was a guy that believed in the human race and feel that we had to squeeze the toothpaste jaw that much more because white society, the black society, the red society has not given up all that it could. He set a precedent. And the precedent that he set wasn't his doing, wasn't my doing, wasn't Mr. Smith's doing, wasn't even the Olympic Forum's doing. It was God. God chose Peter Norman because I could find 10 million other white guys that would have never stood there and have the audacity to say, I support what you guys are doing. Right now, people ask me, say, what about the modern-day athlete? Do you think the modern-day athlete would have had the audacity to step up in defiance and say, no, nah, this is not right? They're blinded 
They're blinded with the fact that they have money waving in front of them, and they've never heard the theory before about all money is not good money. So they say, I'll sell my soul to the devil as long as you keep bringing that money up. They believe the headlines, they say, oh, I'm a superstar basketball player. I'm a superstar NFL star. So that's something that's going to go to the wayside. I remember they used to talk about the Duke, John Wayne. So John Wayne was like an idol. Or well, his girl had just died, Elizabeth Taylor. They did. And I guarantee you, next six months, they never mentioned Elizabeth Taylor, but one or two times a year. They mention it all. A guy like Martin Luther King, or Gandhi, or even a guy that came here and fought years ago, a guy by the name of John Brown. They sit back and talk about these individuals was the negative individuals. Why are they so negative, but yet and still, after durations of time, these names are still prevalent today? Because those are the individuals that said, I'm in boss, man. I'm like a pimple on your neck. I'm not with the rest. I come alive. I'm above the norm. It's not easy to be above the norm, but it feels good when you see somebody else step up and say, man, I like that flavor. I want to be like that too. So when you inspire a young kid to say, hey, man, step up and do the right thing. Because we don't have individuals such as myself that get a chance to go around I see as many white kids out there showing their ass with their pants sagging as I see blacks. I see many white kids as I see blacks on the corner right now selling dope. I see many black and white kids walking around calling women the B word. And even more so, I see more kids, all ethnic backgrounds, going through school opposed to going to school. And why is it like that? Because once again, our conscience have gone to sleep. We chose to say, let me go and do my thing and let this TV and let this Walkman and let the music industry raise my kids. And then who we have as the role models? See, and these guys don't realize that kids and adults choose these individuals as being role models. I don't go and say, man, I want to be your role model. I can never put myself out and say, I want to be your role model. But you as a general public, you can say, Hey, Carlos over there, that's my role model. I want to be just like him. So when these guys go up to Snoop Dogs, when they get up and they get out there and they start advertising, like Snoop is coming out with this new drink called Blast. It's like 12 or 13% alcohol. They're going to be selling it like a soda pop. Middle school kids and grade school kids are going to be buying that stuff every day sneaking. And Snoop is out there advertising for the sake of that dollar. And I have to get to Snoop and tell Snoop, say, man, did you ever hear the old theory about all money is not good money? Look what you're doing to these kids in this community. Think about a guy like Joe Namath. Joe Namath came from Alabama, won the Super Bowl. A lot of guys didn't step up to the plate when Joe Namath called me later on down the line and said, John, I'm going to bring you out. I want to do some things. I'm going to get on TV and I'm going to talk about you. Because many people told him, say, man, don't mention those guys on TV. But Joe, Joe Namath from the South took it upon himself to be his own man. He didn't let somebody write a script and say, follow the script. And that's what most individuals have to start thinking about individuality. I have to be my own man to make my own decisions. That's the problem with these little kids with this gang activity. They follow the stupidest guys to be the gang leaders. And I don't, let me follow him because he got the muscle, but he got a two-cent brain. You the one that should be at Harvard or Yale or, or, or the law school here, but I ain't going to never get there because I'm following an idiot. And then relative to racism, think about some of the brightest minds in your field, the law, that will never get a chance to pursue what God gave them, the intent that God had for them merely because of the color of their skin. Think about somebody that might have the cure for heart disease that would never reach maturity merely because of the color of their skin. Think about your kid having a debilitating illness that someone has a seed to find that cure, and they'll never get there because of the perils that we have in this society called racism, bias, and prejudice. I'm going to leave you all with one thought. And that thought is, 
No child on planet Earth has ever been born a racist. No one has ever been born a racist. Someone in the household came through the household and started developing this kid's mind about bias and prejudice and racism. It's a sick, sad disease. As sad as leprosy was years ago, or the hooping coffee is today for kids. It needs to be wiped out. I can't wipe it out. But we can wipe it out. Think about this. People talk about Mexico City, about this fist right here. Well, I had this left one up. This fist. Okay? And somebody asked me, say, John, say, define what that means, that power sign. I told him, I said, well, look, let me put it to you like this. I said, here's five individuals of color. I ain't going to say they're all black. I say of color. I say, each one of them are very intelligent. Each one of them have a new paradigm as to how things could be better for everybody. But not one of them can step out on his own and make a difference. Because one individual step out there, they'll knock him down. But what happens when that five individuals came together and unified themselves, came together as one? They became a very powerful force. I don't care what your ethnic background is. But when you unify to say we have to move this mountain, the mountain will be moved because we came together as one to do it. That's the greatness about Tommy Smith and John Collins, irregardless of what people might think. We were unified enough to make a statement to society. Forty-three years later, it's still rising up high and high in the sky. God gave me signs. I went to South Africa one day just out the blue. The guy was supposed to meet me to take me around. <coughs> he never got there when I landed. I didn't know nothing about South Africa. I went to a little sugar shack hotel. The guy behind the desk, when I signed the thing, he said, whoa, wait a minute. John Collins, he knew my history better than me. He said, you can't stay here. Come with me. I didn't know this man, but, you know, I was so tired, I was like hypnotized. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. He takes me into Soweto. <coughs> Puts me in these people's house. I'll see you tomorrow. He takes off. There's a big window with no window. It was just a hole in the wall, you know, like where a window should be. No drape, no curtain, nothing. So go find your spot there, like little throw rugs. So I go lay down. <coughs> I go to sleep. Well, in the morning, the sun comes up over there so early, like 4.30 in the morning. The sun is like leaping. And came through that window and woke me up right away. And I sit up on the floor, and I start stretching. You know, when you're tired, and I'm stretching my body like that. And I look up on the wall, and there's a poster of the 1968 Olympics. Now, this was not that long after Mexico. And I'm saying, how the heck did they get a poster of me on the other side of the world? And why did God bring me to this house for me to wake up and start stretching and see this poster? Now, they had two nails up top, and they had a nail on the left. So Peter was seeing, seen, and Tommy was seen on my side was kind of rolling up. <laughs> and I sat there, and I looked at that, and it kind of made me realize right then that what God put me into, he made me like a beacon for society. But the same beacon that I am, you are. The same way I rose through the cinders of this society. You guys have the same right and the same ability to rise the same way. I don't care what your profession is. You're going to be in a critical situation, and you have to make a critical decision. But you can't be indecisive, and you can't be neutral. Either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. You can't scratch your head for 40 years and say, oh, <coughs> I still haven't decided. <coughs> now, talking about decisions, I told the class earlier today, at San Jose State, they built those statues that you saw there. And we had a fantastic team. <coughs> we were, San Jose State, we would have probably won more medals than most nations did in the Olympic Games, just out of San Jose State alone. But when it came time for these guys to make a criti critical decision, they chose to be neutral. And they said, well, I don't understand, because we should have a brick down the base of the statue with our names put on it. And, and Tommy come to me and say, man, John, these guys are saying they should have a, a, a rock with their name, a brick with their name on it. Tell them something, man. 
I said, all right. I said, guys, let me just say this. Let me ask you, why do you think you deserve a stone knife with your name on it? And they said to me, they said, listen, we all ran track together. I said, yeah, that's great. I said, if this was a tape of me breaking, of a statue of me breaking the tape or passing the baton, yes, you deserve a statue. I said, but this statue here evolved beyond athletics. I said, now let me make you understand what I'm saying. I said, just imagine we got on a train. We were all young and idealistic about how we could make this a better situation for all people. So we got on the train and we had this theory about a potential boycott of the 1968 Olympics. I said, everybody sat back and had discussion about it. And then we got down to the nitty gritty. We said, look, man, are we going to do this or are we not going to do it? Are we going to attempt this boycott? So everybody said, yeah, we're going to attempt to do it. So now it's a fact. There's no more theory. So we put the banners on the side of the train, and we get ready to do this boycott. And now the general public that didn't particularly like the fact that we're talking about the blacks will boycott the Olympic Games, and anyone that was sympathetic to their cause would boycott. And we got these flags and signs on the side, and now all of a sudden the missiles start coming, the fire bombs start coming. We're rolling, but the train's on fire. And now they come back 43 years later or 40 years later and say, I deserve to have a, a rock with my name on it. And I said to him, I said, yeah, you know, you, you might. I said, but do me a favor. Open up your shirt. Pull up your pants leg. Take your shirt off and let me see your back. Why? I said, I want to see your burns. I said, because I remember the train was on fire, and I remember I see a lot of people jumping off the train. I said, because y'all were scared and you was indecisive. I said, now, when Mr. Smith, I go to him, say, Tommy, open your shirt up. Pull up your pants there. I see burns all over him. I said, look at my arm. You can see him on me, too. I said, now, if you can show me your burns, I can show you a way to get up there on that statue with us. But I can't make what wasn't. You guys cannot be able to come back 40 years from now when you get ready to go to God and say, I had a lot of opportunities to make the right move. But I didn't have the courage. The courage is in each and every one of y'all to try and make things better. And remember what I said. It's not for you. It's for your kids. God bless you. Thank you. And if we have any questions, I think Mr. Cummins, Dr. Cummins, Professor Cummins, want me to answer some questions if I can. Hey, hey look here, guys. I'm just going to say this on the interim. Uh, JohnCarlos.org, go to the page. If you like the page, tell your friends about it. We, several people have to leave for class, but we do have about uh, 10 minutes for questions. So if you have a question, if you'll step to the, uh, to the mic here. Um, we'll, we'll give a second for folks to uh, get organized. Uh, and I'll remind everyone that we are web streaming live, so please speak to, into the microphone. Uh, Johnny, Mike Mosser from West Virginia. Uh, I think I'm only, the only one here that can consider John a teammate as we competed together with the ITA tr uh, track program back in the early 70s. And great talk. Of course, you've been a leader for years and years and years. And I don't know whether you know this or not, but West Virginia lost their track team uh, back in 2003, and you talked opportunity in your talk. You said opportunity many, many, many times. And I think West Virginia needs to reconsider bringing back the, back the track team because generally all of your sprinters, all of your, your uh, field event people all come from uh, the black uh, athletes. Right. So I know you had a football career a lot of that speed and training um, go hand in hand, learning how to run fast, being quick. And I think the opportunity for the black community is certainly diminished by taking sports like track and field away from the universities. Well, and there, it's, it's, it's 
going across the country, well, as you well know. Well, I'll tell you. Thank you. After we retired from uh, San Jose State, they abolished the track program in San Jose. I don't think there's no school in the nation that had a better reputation for track and field <coughs> than San Jose State. They abolished the program there. I think they abolished our program more for shame. It was ashamed of who we were, what we did at that particular time. But nevertheless, they still don't have the program. But uh, people power is the way you're going to get it back. And you can stand at that mic all day by yourself and talk about it, but you have to motivate people to get together and make them realize their mistake. So once again, people power is how you're going to move that mountain. Okay? Hi, Adrian Hi. Williams. I'm a professor here in the College of Human Resources and Education. And you just, I had a question that I was going to hold, but you just said something about people power, and I think that was uh, part of the issue I have. I find, as someone who was born after, uh, <laughs> after even 1970, for people in the, um, that there's still a lot of fear of reprisal. And although people have fear about whether or not they're going to lose their job or whether or not, I think they've lost perspective in the fact that some pe people used to risk losing their lives. Well, and I, how do you, I mean, how do you motivate people in um, when, when people have, as you said, their consciousness has fallen asleep and people have fear of that <coughs> kind of what I consider really petty issues compared to the <coughs> challenges that exist? Well, you know, we're in law school right now, so like if you was doing, in the law case, uh, that it would be like a case study, right? Someone had to do it before. You say, man, these guys had everything to lose because they threatened their life ahead of time. But they stood. I remember I gave a speech at UCLA. Uh, they asked me to come there to speak on affirmative action. And I went and they gave an arousing speech. And after the speech was over, a lot of the youngsters came to me and told me, said, well, Mr. Collins, you know, I, I have feared to step up and do X, Y, Z on the fact that I'm getting ready to go to the NFL and I'll miss my opportunity to go to the NFL or, or they might take my scholarship away or this or that. And I told them, I said, well, man, I don't want to vilify what I'm telling you. I said, but I was the most hated man in the world. I said, but they still drafted me to play in the football league. I said, you're going to do far less than what I did. And if they drafted me, I'm sure they're going to draft you. I said, but what you have to do, man, you have to find the man within you. Understand? I can't st speak for someone as to why they will or why they won't. All I can do is suggest them to go to that man in the mirror, that woman in the mirror, and find out who you are. And that's the biggest problem where people have fear because they don't know who they are. I'm afraid to do something, man, because I don't know who I am. I never got in touch with me. I'm just getting up, going to work, going through the motion. You know, I never really considered can I truly make a difference in this life that I live? So what you have to do is start instilling this as a youngster. You know, when you see kids, young kids, you have to instill in them, say, hey, you know, there's a right side, there's a wrong side. Which side are you going to choose? Okay? Like I tell guys, I say, man, it's the prison wall. It's the right side and the wrong side. Which side are you going to choose? And I make them understand. I say, man, as things evolve in life, I say, they have a place called a think tank. I say, in this think tank, these guys used to wear three-piece suits and the attaché case, go to the long table, had a pad and a bell. <coughs> I say, now they still go, but they wear flip-flops and Hawaiian shirts, but they still got the attaché case in the table. I say, now, <coughs> mind you, I say, in this think tank, they, they write up the equation is we have far more criminals than we have prisons. We want to build prisons, but every time we try and build a prison, while well, you can't build a prison here, the university is here. Or you can't build a prison over here, the church is here. Or you can't build it here, city hall is here. How do we solve the equation? And somebody rings the bell eventually and say, based on time, now we can solve this problem. We can build a prison anywhere. Only difference is, opposed to building a prison above ground, now we're going to start building prisons below ground. And we can put them up anywhere. I say, now, how inhumane is that? But now you don't have God's son. That's God's son up there, neon light. I said, but you putting yourself in the situation there because you had choices. You have a choice to step up and say to a kid in the neighborhood, say, you know something, man? You're a pretty smart kid. I've been watching you. But I think you're going the wrong way. We have parents right now that's afraid to even talk to their kids because they never talked to the kid for the first 16 years. Now all of a sudden I want to be a parent. Now you're supposed to start parenting from the first minute that child comes home. 
until we start doing this, there's a lot of people who have a problem finding out who they are. And you ain't going to never have courage to do nothing until you find out who you are. Uh, I've always been a fighter, even to the point where my brothers, would, they was docile. They would never fight. And I remember when I was a little kid on Lennox Avenue, and a guy came and broke a, a broomstick over my brother's back. Back. I'm looking at my brother, man, like, you going to let him do that? What's wrong with you? And I don't think I was like 10, 11. I told my brother, come on, let's go home. Go back home. I said, all right, man, I'll see you later. I'm going back out. I went back out, and I found this dude. I told him, I said, man, my brother, he ain't no fighter. I'm the fighter. I don't have no fight with you. I said, you gonna have one in a minute. And we got it on. Now I got a reputation for going out. I didn't go out looking for trouble. I didn't come in this world looking for trouble. But when trouble comes, I know how to deal with it. And I'm not going to run from it. Understand? Like I tell the students, well, I got a lot of threats on my life over the years. A lot of people, we're going to kill you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. But when I was with Dr. King 10 days before he died, and he told me that they sent a letter and it had a bullet with his name on it, he wouldn't have to wait long for it. The first thing I did with Dr. King when he told me that is pull my shades down, because I used to wear shades all the time. I pulled them down, and I wanted to have eye contact with him. I wanted to look through no glass. I wanted to look dead in his eyes. You know what I'm looking for, right? I'm looking for the fear factor. A man tell you that somebody said they're going to kill you, and he had no control over that. He's supposed to be shaking. He was a rocker in Gibraltar. And it's the same thing that I took from him. When I went to Mexico City, yeah, they talked about they was going to kill me before, during, and after. But Dr. King said they can kill me, but they can never kill what I stand for. And that's the true belief that I have. You can kill me. And if somebody wanted to do a coward act and shoot me, I just pray that God let me see who it is before I go out. You know why? Because I just want them to know that it ain't going to end because I left here. I'm going to wait for you. Because you coming too. Any more questions? <coughs> Carlos Marlon LeBlanc, I'm the head men's soccer coach here at the university. Thank you for nice coming. You. I have a question for you because you brought up affirmative action. Right. And you hear a lot of people talk about we don't need affirmative action anymore. So I was interested to hear your take on today and what you think about equality today. Um, comes to mind is a Chris Rock joke. He talks about rich and wealthy. <coughs> right. He, he brings up Oprah. Oprah's rich. And Bill Gates is wealthy. Right. And that if Bill Gates had Oprah's money, he'd throw himself out the window and commit suicide. Right, because he's a poor man. <laughs> so I'm interested to hear what you feel about today, despite multi-million dollar contracts and all this other stuff, <coughs> what you think about equality today. Well, you know, affirmative action is, is primarily to say uh, we need to uh, level the playing field and give everyone an equal opportunity to be successful in this life. Give everyone an opportunity to expand their mind, to have an opportunity to go to college, irregardless of what your ethnic background is, irregardless of what your economic state is. As I stated earlier, you know, uh, creativity doesn't come at one race or one religion. Creativity is across the board. And if you're going to hold one uh, group of individuals up merely because of the color of their skin, and it's, it's like a guy looking in a gas tank, and can't remember whether he put gas in it, so he lights the torch to go down and see if he got gas. Eventually, it's going to blow up in your face. And that's what's happening with society. We have to the point where we're saying, well, we're going to take care of the elitists and make sure they're cool. Like even with the President of the United States right now. And I see a, a lot of things that happen right now with this war that's going on in, in uh, uh, where, Libya. Uh, and then, you know, the way they jumped on him. And I said, damn, I didn't hear them jump on George Bush one time for for going and starting the war, they're talking about the weapons of destruction. We ain't found one weapon yet. But we was in a massive war there. But I ain't see them jump up and down on George Bush the way I see them jump down up on this man. And I'm saying that we had to come behind and realize that we're one nation. Irregardless of whether you're Republican or Democrat or, 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 or just, uh, what do you say, nonpartisan, we're still one nation. When they drop bombs, they ain't going to drop no bomb on the Republicans or they're going to drop on the Democrats. They're going to drop them on us. So we better start getting ourselves together and realize I don't care who it is. If they're your command in chief, you better get behind it. You know, I don't remember no other president in recent years that always referred to himself as a command in chief. I hear other people call uh, 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 Barack Obama. I say, who is Barack Obama? Oh, well, Barack, you know, Barack. Who was Barack? Are oh, you meaning the president? 
I said, man, I ain't never heard you show George Bush until he left office. Give the man his due. You don't have to like him. It's just like if, if, if a person runs for office and you say, I didn't vote for him, the fact that you didn't vote for him doesn't mean that he don't have to serve you as well as he served the people that voted for him. He serves all of the people. And we have to start coming to an understanding that we got to start making decisive decisions about this kind of stuff. Affirmative action is needed, my man, and they have to keep it afloat. Because if not, there's going to be so many individuals, just as the individual here is talking about the fact that they stop track and field or they stop a lot of the sports where blacks participate in. They feel like they don't need those sports now because they got the big money making sports. They got football that's making <coughs> billions of dollars. They got basketball that's bringing in billions of <coughs> dollars. <coughs> those are small sports. And what's going to happen is when they knock out track and field, they're going to start knocking back a lot of the women's sports as well. Where are we going to be then? And when I was telling them at UCL, I said, let me ask you this question. I said, if you are afraid to step up for affirmative action right now and you have that decision to make, to go to the chancellor, to go to the president of the university and ask him, so where do you stand on affirmative action? What's your take on it? If you choose not to do it, that means now in order for your daughter 15, 20 years from now to go to college, she's going to have to be a boxer. You understand? In order for her to get education. Because that's the only thing that's going to be left for minorities to get into school is through athletics. And see, and I always have to try and set a precedent when people come and try and do a story on John Carlos and they get mad at me because they tell me, well, John, we're going to do this story, <coughs> but we're going to send a photographer. We want you to go over to the track. No problem. I go over to the track. I throw my suit on, my tie, and walk over with my shoes shine. And then, well, 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 where's your sweats? I look at them and say, at my house. Why come you don't have your sweats on? I say, man, let me tell you something. I say, you see that little crack of light right there? I said, that's how small track and field was in my life. It's just a little portion of my life. That's, track and field is not my life. I said, so if you think that I'm going to go put sweats on and dictate or, or, or expound upon the kids and let the kids think that I'm a jock and that's all I am, then you're mistaken. Well, that's the way everybody does. I said, well, go with everybody else. But if I come out, I'm coming out representing me the way I want to be represented, not the way you want to depict me to society. Because a lot of kids see you do it, first thing they think is, oh, well, I'm supposed to do that. No, nah, man, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to come out and let them know, I'm an athlete with a business mind. I use my athletics to get where I was as a businessman. Most of our kids need to start learning these things, and they're going to have to learn it through those that came before them. Like I tell you, I looked high and low for that statue of Benjamin Franklin. Every time I would see a statue, I would look at the statue and try and get a reference as to how old this individual was when they depicted this statue of him. And 99.9% .9 of the statues you see in America, somebody's 60 some odd years old. Until I saw that one of Benjamin Franklin, and it kind of made me feel good to know that I was 23 years old in that statue that they put up in San Jose. And it let society know, you don't have to let all that water going in the bridge for you to decide to make a difference in society. How you doing, Mr. Carlos? I'm an uh, ex-athlete as well and I'm working on my master's degree. I seen an uh, article that I thought was pretty <coughs> interesting. It was talking about how uh, Newt, Gin Newt Gingrich thought that feels that a way to address the economy is to, like, start. He, he feels that it's best to start pulling a lot of these uh, scholarships away from athletes as a way to address the woes of the economy. I want to know if you heard about that and how you feel about it. And you kind of addressed on it already because – what you're talking about with some of the programs? Well, man, you know, Newt Gingrich is, is rhetoric. You sweep that under the rug and just forget about it. Just walk on over that. Okay. You know? I mean, that's it, 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 that's ridiculous statement for me to get up and make that. Absolutely. I, I thought it was, too. That's why I wanted to ask you about it. But also I wanted to ask you about um, <coughs> if you notice a difference from when, when you were coming up working on uh, in schooling, at one time schooling where they had black schools and white schools, okay. even the colleges and stuff like that, well, now – uh, a friend and I, a friend and myself, were talking one day about how a lot of the, a lot of the kids would prefer to go to the, the the big programs because you have a better shot of getting an opportunity, getting a look in the league, and making the money, where they're not going to get the education 
that they might receive from the minority schools that are that are working <coughs> with them. I, I want to know if you if you've seen any of that. That's or, a two-sided situation. Right. Uh, you know, black schools of years ago were very strong black schools and in institutions of education. In modern time, a lot of the black schools have fallen off in terms of the, the true administrators of the schools. You understand how they appropriate monies and how they appropriate this for scholastic programs and so forth like that. A lot of black schools squandered that away. Okay? Now, any kid that go to a white school or black school, it doesn't matter. It, it all depends upon where the kid's focus is and where his mind is and how focused this individual is as to why he's in this institution and what he hopes to get out of it. I don't care which school you go to. It just depends upon whether you serious about going to school. All the schools are making all the schools are making the money. All of them are making the money. I was telling the class earlier today, I said, you know, when you sit back and think about it, let's say if I'm Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Let's say I'm at UCLA. All right. I played basketball my freshman year and I was a superstar when I came in from Palm Memorial in New York. I'm a superstar. How much is my scholarship worth at UCLA? Back at the time, you said maybe what, sixty thousand, seventy thousand dollars? All right, now if I took my jersey that said Kareem Abdul Jabbar on the back. And I said, How many jerseys can I sell in a year? That first year. And then at the same time, we have a basketball arena like the arena you guys have here on this campus. And say, Imagine how many people bought their bus through the turnstile and sit in them seats to watch Kareem slam. Okay? Then say, Okay, let's break it down to hot dogs, beers, popcorns, peanuts that he drew into the stadium to buy these goods. Now the fact that they say, oh, not only is he a good athlete, but he's a super athlete, and we don't just want the local people to see it, we want the people to see him nationally. So now we come knocking with the contract for the TV rights. We had one TV program, you might have got $800,000. When they come down and tell you, you say, man, we want to televise 13 of your games. That's as much as $16 million. Understand? How many times is that scholarship paid for relative to the money that this individual brought to the school? And this is happening all across the country. See, and the, and the difference is those individuals that's preaching that word called amateurism, these individuals are being concerned about self and not being concerned about the fact that these young athletes have families and responsibilities as well. Even though they're going to school as a youngster, a lot of them got kids. A lot of them in college right now with wives. And now you sit back and you say, well, we can't even give you a computer because that will take away from your amateur status. Here's something that's going to help them in the institution of education. But the NC2A say, no, nope, we can't give it to you because it's going to mess with your amateur status. As the time I was running, I got $2 a day. I go to Europe, man, it's 110,000 people chanting my name. They paid big bucks to get into the stadium. But the AU is giving me $2 a day. I'm gone for two months. Who's paying my bills when I get home? And there's nobody concerned. Nobody can come and say, well, John, we know you was running for America, and we know you was out of town, or you got your back rent, or your kids need school supplies, you need groceries. It don't come like that. And the only way it's going to change, man, is say we're not trying to bend the rule other than the fact that, hey, man, you have enough revenue to share. Share it in a sense that we all can get over and get something out of it. If nothing else, I tell them, say, man, if you go to a school and you represent the school as an amateur, tell the school, say, man, what guarantee? Can you give me a guarantee for my first child that's born because I went to the school for four years and guaranteed my kid to get a free education? But you got to have, like you say, you got to have basketballs to step up to present that. All right, so look like the time is up, guys. Girl. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, man. Okay. Well, I got a lot of shirts today. Here, we'll put them all in here. Please.